Hi, this is a six part tutorial series to teach you how to make your first platformer game in GameMaker. The goal of this tutorial series is to teach you some relatively simple tools and how powerful those tools are in this app. And thus far in our game project, we've implemented the platformer mechanics, moving, jumping, all that, a checkpoint system, room transitions, a game camera, screen shake, a tutorial sign system. We've even added sounds and an auto tiling system for graphics. And now we are going to make a title screen and a save load system so that after players close out of the game, they can reopen the game and uh, it will reload to where they were when they last closed the game. So let's get started. First, I'll try to go quickly here. In our splash, our R splash room, we're going to duplicate it. Oh, sorry. Oh, no. I Okay. Bad start. I need to look at my notes more carefully. We're going to open our splash in the creation code and we're going to remove this initialize script because we're going to have a button on the title screen handle that for us. And we are now going to duplicate our splash and we will call it our title. In both our splash and our title, add an instances layer called player, because as you recall, our fade in and fade out system works with a player layer. So we need to have that in all of our rooms. So in our splash, create a new layer, call it player. And in our title, create a new layer and call it player. Now we're going to add some start screens. Uh, in the initialize script, scripts, initialize, delete where it says go to our level one, just to remove that. Don't need it anymore for what we're about to do. The button we'll add uh, to the splash screen will take us to the title screen. And then uh, this splash screen setup where we have a screen before we get to the title screen, it's only really important for HTML5 games or web browser games, which are the kind of games that I make that ensures that uh, the user has selected the window or the tab, the web browser tab that the game is in, uh, or else the game doesn't really run properly and the sound doesn't work and weird things like that. So that's why we have a splash screen before our title screen. Uh, for your future game projects, if you don't plan on distributing on the web, you can skip that step, but I think it's just a good uh, habit to get into. Uh, and then uh, we're going to make it so our title screen has our save and load buttons uh, on it, or our load button at least. So first, for the button for the splash screen to go to the title screen, we need to create a new sprite. So let's minimize these. Create sprite, and I am going to call it. Uh, what am I? What am I going to call it? S button. Yeah, S button. And it's going to be the same sprite we're going to use for all of our buttons. We're going to change the canvas size to be 300 by 100. Apply. And. We're going to set the origin to be middle center and we can fill it with really any color because uh, the sprite is really only the place where the button is in the room and then we're going to use a draw event to actually draw the button click the fill tool and i'm going to choose sort of this uh yeah sort of that bright teal color works middle center origin appropriate size close out of that now create a new object call it O button splash. Assign the appropriate sprite, S button. And before you do anything else, open our splash room. And in the instances layer, drag in O button splash. Uh, right about there. Close out of that. Now back to this object, the splash uh, splash button object, we need to set some variables. So in the create event, write X, meaning the button's X position we wanted in the center of the screen. So we're, we will write display get GUI width divided by two. Y equals display get GUI height divided by two x1 equals x minus sprite width divided by 2 in parentheses there. y1 equals y minus sprite width divided by 2. 
x2 equals x plus sprite width divided by 2, and y2 equals y plus sprite. Uh, I did this wrong. No. Sprite width here. This needs to be sprite height. There we go. Then here is sprite width again. Then here is sprite height divided by two. There we go. Sprite width, sprite height, sprite width, sprite height, minus, minus, plus, plus, x, y, x, y, x, y, x, y. There we go. So these are going to be the top uh, top left corners and bottom right corners of the rectangle for our button object. And then the last variable, hover equals false. So now to know where uh, whether our mouse is hovering over the button, let us add some code in a step event. If distance to point mouse x comma mouse y close parentheses is less than or equal to zero that's saying hey is the mouse hovering over the collision mask of our object open and close curly brackets set hover to equal true and if it isn't else open curly brackets close curly brackets indent hover equals false now make a draw event um, we would normally write draw self here, but since we actually don't want to see the sprite that we're using, we're going to be drawing all the graphics that we need. The draw event will just turn off the sprite and just draw the following things instead. Uh, but it'll keep the collision box in place for hovering, which is very convenient. Uh, so for the button text, let's make a comment. Button text. Draw set h align. Ba center. Draw set v align ba middle. Draw set font f buttons. Oops, you need a new button font. So let's create a new font. Font create font. There we go. Call this f buttons. I'm going to use the consolas font again, but I'm just going to make it bigger. C. Oh, consolas or on Mac, I recommend the font Menlo. I'm going to set it to be like 26. Style is bold, and we can always go back and change that if it doesn't look good. But here, this should change. Yep, F buttons. And now back to the draw event here. Uh, don't worry about this, can, this caution. It's because we created a new asset. We close out of that and reopen. It removes the caution. We'll write if bang hover. So if hover is false, open curly brackets, close curly brackets, else open curly brackets, close curly brackets. So if hover is false, do this. If hover is true, do this. So indent here. Uh, so everything else we're going to write in this if and else statement for when hover is false, write draw that color, see aqua, draw rectangle x1 y1 x2 y2 and then outline we do want it to be an outline this time so i will write true and draw text x y click to begin now for when hover is true we want it to be a little different draw set color c aqua Draw rectangle x1, y1, x2, y2. And we don't we want it to be filled in, so I'll write false here. Then draw that color C black. Draw text x, y, click to begin. It's very similar, but you'll notice with the draw rectangle that the first one is just an outline. The second one is filled in, but and changes the text color. So let's check it out. Nice. So when we hover over it, it changes appropriately, and the collision system is working appropriately. So it's detecting when my mouse is over it. it doesn't do anything yet, though. So now we're going to make it so we can click the button, and it will take us to the title room. And this is very simple. In the step event in the distance to point if statement, 
after it sets hover to true, add fade out. Oh, no, not fade out. We are writing another if condition statement. If mouse check button rest. So we're hovering over and we're clicking. MB any, meaning any mouse button, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, fade out the room. Here you can see some things that I didn't do correctly with the curly brackets. I haven't fixed those yet. But the first thing we need is the room. So our title and the X target X target Y for our player. There's no player in the title room, so we can just put zero and zero. We do need to put numbers but it doesn't matter because there's no player that we're going to be creating. Uh, so yeah, our transition script, those fade out scripts are very versatile. We can go to the title room even though we're not moving where the player is. So now we can test it out. So it'll fade out and take us to the title room, which will just be a blank screen. It did. So we're going to use a lot of this code for our title screen buttons. So this is not work that is wasted, but we have slightly more to do here. We're going to add a sound effect to indicate when the button is highlighted and not highlighted. We're also going to make a sound for when it gets clicked on. So make two sounds. So right click sound, create sound. We're going to call the first sound uh, SND button hover. And then I'm going to duplicate it and call it SMD button click. So on SMD button click, I'm going to open that and find button click sound. And over SMD button hover, I'm going to locate that and find button hover sound. And now in the O button splash step event in the distance to point condition, because this is where we're changing where hover is setting to true. We're going to add that hover sound. If uh, yeah, that's hover to true. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is where I need to do it. I need to do it right before. So right before it sets hover to true. If bang hover, so if hover is false, audio play sound S and D button, hover, priority of one, loop, false. And because it's checking if hover is first false, that'll play the sound and then it'll immediately set hover to true so it won't keep repeating that sound over and over again. It just plays at a single frame because hover immediately is set to true. And then for the click sound, if mouse check button pressed, now we did check button press, not just check button. Check button checks to see if it's being held down, but if we use the pressed function. It just checks if it's been clicked and it will only run one frame. And because of that, we don't need to add any if condition statements. We can just write audio play sound S and D button click priority of one loop false. And it'll only play it once. So let's test it out. Hover. Click. It works. So that's it for the splash screen. Now for the title screen, we can use a lot of the same code for the buttons we'll be adding. First, uh, we'll add a button to start the game. So right click O button splash and duplicate it. Call this one O button start. Once again, go immediately to our title and place the button. So our title instances layer, drag an O button start somewhere there doesn't really matter where basically where you want it but we're going to be changing its location in its code now duplicating it allows us to avoid having to copy and paste too much uh, we don't have to change much to make this a start button open o button start in the create event uh, all you have to really change is the y value just get rid of that so this will set it in the center of the room uh, but we want to be able to sort of adjust where its vertical position is. So it'll always be in the center, but now we can sort of adjust in the room editor where its vertical position is. And now in the step event of O button start, we need to just change where the button takes you. So instead of taking us to the title room, we want it to take us to our level one with 
global dot check point x and global dot check point y. And in the draw event, all you have to change is from click to begin to like start game, or I'm going to like make it kind of program me. I will write initialize and initialize. Now this is the same name as our initialize script. So uh, don't get confused. This is just text. And then in the our title creation code, we will write the initialize script, <laughs> initialize, and fade in. So our title room will fade in. It'll also declare all the global variables first. There we go. Now we have our button to start the game. And it starts the game. Close out of that. Now create a new sprite. Create sprite and call it S title logo and import the title image title. Set its origin to be middle center. Now create an object. Call it O title logo. Assign the appropriate sprite. And add a create event. And just write x equals room width divided by two. So it's in the center of the room no matter where we place it. Uh, but you can adjust its vertical position just like the title button, the start button. Now go to our title, drag that in in the instances layer. Here's our title. There we go. We'll put it near the top. Right there looks good. Now to make it more polished, you can create a new tile layer in the room and use that tile set that we've created and just sort of add it around to make it look a little better of a title room. So I'm going to add a new tile layer, just call it, rename it to just tiles. It doesn't matter where it's placed, but I'm just going to put it underneath all of our instances layer just to be consistent. Uh, select tiles, select the tile set that we've created, go to libraries, select auto tile, and we can add some visual polish to our title screen. Oh, select instances layer and just move title down a little bit. Back to tiles, libraries, auto tile, and I'm just going to add like corners there. That looks good. Lastly, in the room code script, lastly for what we're doing right now, there's still more to do. Scripts, room code, Add the line window that cursor br none. Uh, so that after we get to like a level, like a proper level, it turns off the mouse because we don't use mouse controls in the game. So we turn it off. And then uh, we need the mouse when we're on the title screen and uh, to navigate the menus. So in the initialize script, we're going to add window that cursor br default. Now check to see if that works. So we have a mouse, we have a mouse, and then we get to the room, our mouse disappears. We can also move it outside of our game to see it. It's important because we're going to have a system to navigate back to the, the title screen from the game, and we want to be able to turn on the mouse again when we get to the title screen. All right, so now we're going to add a save and load system to our game. We're going to add a delete current game file button and a save load system so players can return to the game at different points and continue their game. So first we need to write some scripts, a save game script and a load game script. So create a script, create script, call this one save game and write if file exists save.sav, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, file, delete, save.sav, 
close quote, close parentheses, semicolon. Then after that, write ini underscore open save dot sav. And ini is like a like a powerful text file. So it's going to create a new text file called save.sav. INI write real. Call this progress, comma, room, comma, global dot checkpoint room. You make this a little bigger. So we're going to do this a bunch. So let me explain this. What it does is that it adds a line of text to this text file that we created. And INI files are kind of nice because they're organized. And the first section of this text uh, file is going to be called the progress section. And then the name of the value that we're saving is going to be called room. And then the value that it gets assigned is our checkpoint room. Uh, whatever is currently saved will be saved to this value in the text file. So we're going to do this a bunch with other values. I and I write real. Also in the progress section, call this one x, global.checkpoint x. I and I write real progress section y y global dot checkpoint y. Notice that with my x and y here, they're in quotes because it's just a name. And then I and I close. So whenever the script is called, it's going to read the, these global variables uh, for checkpoints and then save them to this text file on the player's computer. Now for the load game script, create a script called load game, load game, and write here, if file exists, save.sav, open curly brackets, close curly brackets, ini open, save.sav, Global dot checkpoint room here. Let me make this a little wider. Equals I and I read real progress section room value. And if it doesn't have anything assigned to it, we'll have a default value of our level one. Global dot checkpoint X equals I and I read real progress, x, oh, quote, x, close quote, comma, and then a default value of just zero. And then global dot checkpoint y equals i and i read real progress y zero. Then i and i close and then fade out global dot checkpoint room, global dot checkpoint x, global dot checkpoint y. Oh, wow. there's our load game. So this is going to open the save file and then check these values and find the values and then assign the values to our global variables. So that's how it's going to load the game. So and then after that, it's going to transition us to the appropriate room and location in that room. Yep, that works appropriately. I'm just going to check something really quick with our fade. Is it our fade in script? Fade out script. I'm just going to check the fade out script. Yeah, that works all right. So we use the global checkpoints here, which get assigned to the target locations there. So that works out. So to test it, we need to choose where the game is going to use the save game script, and the checkpoints are perfect for that. So open our checkpoint objects in the step event, and right after it sets all these global variables, we can write save game, open and close parentheses, semicolon. And the death script, uh, let's go there, make it a little wider. We're going to wrap where it sets the global target variables and the fade out script and an if statement and add an else statement for the entire script. So the entire script is going to look like this. Let me show you what it's going to look like. In death, it's going to write, I'm going to write if bang 
file exists, meaning if the file doesn't exist, save.sav, meaning we don't have a save file yet, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, we are going to copy, cut this and move it here. So if we don't have a save file, just go to our checkpoint room, checkpoint X and checkpoint Y. And then else, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, we're going to write load game. So if there is a save file, just load game. And then we're going to uh, have the explosions, screen shake, audio, then destroy the player object. And this seems right. So when the player dies, it'll check to see if the save file is there. If it is, load up those global variables, fade out. Or if it doesn't exist, just go to the last known checkpoint. But if one does exist, load the game. So we're going to check to see if it works now by having our player touch something bad. Yep, it loads that up. So I'm going to also go touch a checkpoint really quick. Checkpoint is touched. Now I loads it up there. Very good. Close that. Now go to our O button start object to the step event. And we're going to replace fade out here with something a little different. So instead of just fading out immediately when we click, uh, when we click the button, we're going to add an if statement. If bang file exists, so if the file doesn't exist, save.sav, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, indent, load game. Oh, sorry, not bang. Oh, I'm so sorry. Just file exists. So if a save file exists, load the game. Else, meaning if the save file doesn't exist, do this fade out code that we had before. Indent that. So we, we replace the fade out line with this. It checks to see if a file exists, if a save file exists. If it does exist, we just load the game. If we don't have a save file that exists yet, we just fade out to our level one and go to the global checkpoints. So now let's test it out. Now we should have a save file, so it should load us up at our checkpoint there. Now we need a button to be able to delete the save for when we want to start a new game, and we just need to add a button to the start menu. So we're going to close out of that and we're going to duplicate our start button and call it O button delete save. Open that up. Oh, first let's make sure we add it to our room so we don't forget. So open the title room, instances layer, O button delete save. We're going to put it right below it, below the start button. Back here in the draw event, we're going to change the text to say something programmy, delete.save, delete.save. Everything else should be the same. In the, its step event, make this bigger, we're going to delete load game here when we click on the button. If file exists, save.sav, instead of loading the game, we're going to delete the file. File, delete, save.sav. If it exists, delete it. Close parentheses, semicolon. And then we uh, don't need an if statement right here. We can just delete this else statement, I think. Delete it. Keep the curly bracket there. And after that, we will write initialize to reinitialize all the global variables. And then instance destroy because if there is no save file, we don't need a delete save button. So if there's a save uh, file located, we can click it and it will delete the save file. It will reinitialize all of the global variables and then destroy this button. Uh, we just need to add something to the create event because when we start the game for the very, very first time, there's not gonna be a save file. And so we don't need that uh, delete save button. We go to its create event and at the very top, we can just write if 
uh, bang file exists, meaning if this file doesn't exist, save.sav. So if we don't have a save file, close parentheses, close parentheses, open curly bracket, close curly bracket, instance, destroy. So if there's no save file, just removes the button so we never see it. Uh, let's run the game. So there is a save file, so this button will appear. We initialize the game, it loads us up there. Let's rerun the game. If we hit delete save, and now hit initialize, starts the game fresh. <coughs> Lastly, we should give the player a way to navigate back to the title menu. So let's go to O player object, minimize this, go to game control in the O player step event, and where it says quick restart game. Instead, replace that game restart to, uh, let's change VK enter, let's change it to VK escape. The escape key, which is typical to go to title menus on the keyboard, VK escape and change this to fade out, our title zero zero, because we just want to fade out and go to the title menu. So test it out. Click to begin, initialize, hit the escape key, Take us back here, initialize. And notice my mouse button is disappearing when I'm in a room, a level. If I go back to the title screen, I get the mouse back. Hit initialize, go here, save, hit a checkpoint. Now hit escape, and now we have a delete save here. If we hit initialize, it takes us back to that checkpoint. If I hit escape, back to the title room, I can delete the save, and initialize, starts us back at the beginning of the game. So our save load system is working. So let's just do one last thing. Since this is part of a title screen, let's add uh, some credits to the title screen to write who made the game. So simply create a new object, call it O credits in the draw event. Simply write the following things. Draw set h align fa center. Draw set v align fa middle. Draw set font f default. Draw set color to be c aqua, because everything in our game is that aqua color. Draw text, open parentheses, and then open parentheses. So there's two of them. Room width divided by two. So that's our X location. And then just Y, wherever we place the object. And then the text, I'm going to write because I made the game a game concept slash prototype by Sky Laurel Anderson, close quote, close parentheses, semicolon, and then draw text again. Again, two open parentheses, room width divided by two, close parentheses, comma, Y plus I don't know, it's 20 enough, hopefully. Comma, open quotes, and then my website, skylorel.net. And you can write something else there if you'd like, but since I made the game, this is what I'm putting. And then I'm going to make sure to put this OCredits object in our title room. So open our title, select instances, select O credits, bring it in, and I'm going to put it close to the bottom. I might need to turn off the grid there so I have a little bit more control before I place it. See if that's too low. A game concept slash prototype by Scalarell Anderson, Scalarell Dunnot. It actually fits perfectly. I might need to lower that second website name later, but that looks good. Beautiful. That's our game. Uh, now, we only have one more video left in this tutorial series, and what we will be covering is difficulty settings and having a an options menu that we can reach from the title screen to adjust difficulty settings. Uh, and with that, you should have the tools in your toolbox to like adjust other settings in your game, like even like button remapping if you want to do that too. So I will see you there.